All right, Zig coming in on the top 10 on the show. We have Eugene Hutz, singer, songwriter, guitarist, and front man of the band Go Go Bardello. Eugene's the real deal. Pure punk ethos, deep thinker, punk philosopher, and an extremely talented musician. And has been a hero of mine for many years. It's been a complete and absolute honor to get to pick his brain for a bit. In high school, a dear friend of mine, Zach Dimmer, a tattoo artist from Cleveland, Ohio, also a bass player, introduced me to Go-Go Bardello by showing me their Saturday Night Live performance. And I didn't even know what to think of it. It was this crazy high-energy performance with all these different like folk instruments and and a gypsy punk band and like I I was aware of like gypsy music and aware of like Django Reinhardt and had like a a liking for that sound but never seen it performed with such ferocity and my high school brain didn't know how to take it um, it took me like maybe a couple months later to even really really wrap it around my head and realize like this is amazing like before I just was kind of shocked and then then was hooked but what really sealed the deal was seeing them live um open for primus was the first time i saw them in columbus me and coda uh, and that that was the most like high energy show and i remember for some reason i was super sick and for i slept through primus i was so sick but like for go go bardello we were up and in the pit and you, it was just like from the downbeat onward that whole show you were moved they bring an energy to their performance which is infectious and potent and carries on i remember that show like listening to their records after that show i heard them differently like they were sonically different it, there was more that that feel from seeing them live was within that record so i highly recommend if you have yet to see gogo bordello alive you do that um, and it didn't stop there. I started really diving into these records and I would just look up interview clips with Eugene and like, he's got this bit, um, on failure and how, if you are not attempting and not failing, you're not doing it right. And that really struck with me and, and really brought to life how amazing of a songwriter and thinker this guy is. So to be able to talk with him today and share this conversation with you is beyond an honor. But anywho, let's get into what Eugene has going on. Go Go Bardello has a new album out called Solidarity, and they have a 15-year anniversary of Super Tirana that just came out as well. Solidarity is a masterfully powerful record, and I think one of Go Go Bardello's best records, um, but I say that every time they come out with a new record. Um, anyway, we're going to listen to a track off off the record. We're going to listen to Take Only What You Can Carry, one of the most impactful tunes on this record, in my humble opinion. Take Only What You Can Carry, Gogo Bardello, Solidarity. Take Only What You Can Carry, Gogo Bardello, Solidarity. Um, right? Amazing. If you're new to the show... I play in a band called C Level, letter C dash level. Um, we are a high energy funk punk reggae rock group that takes acoustic 12 string guitars and runs them through amplifiers. We are highly, highly influenced and inspired by Gogo -Go Bardello. Um, we have a show coming up November 12th at the Winchester with Wanyama and Land of Panda in Cleveland, Ohio. So if you're in Ohio, uh, the Winchester, November 12th. If you enjoy my canter and think maybe this guy has something musically to offer, that would be a place to hear it. Or check us out on the interwebs at c-level44.com. Anywho, I caught Eugene going from travel to sound check. And uh, throughout this interview, there's like some type of delay with the phone where you hear me talk a second later through his phone. And uh, I did a pretty darn good job of getting rid of all of it. There's a couple situations where I couldn't because it took away what he said, and I didn't want to do that. Gogo -Go Bardell is on tour now, so check out gogobardello.com for the tour dates. Um, Solidarantines out now on all streaming platforms. I highly recommend you see them and you listen to this new record. If you guys can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms if you enjoy what you hear, it really helps me keep talking to cool guests and sharing their insights with you.
So without further ado, here's my conversation with Eugene. But awesome, um, to start off, uh, there's this uh, Joe Strummer spiel where he says um, uh, people are doing horrible things to each other and we all follow our own little mouse track, but people can change anything. And without people, we're nothing. I'm sure you've heard this before, but I think... Yeah, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine sampled it into one of his songs, yeah. Yeah? For that new yeah. uh, release that came out? Um, well, he sampled it for his own release because it, I think it, it was said on a, during one of the radio shows that Joe Strummer was doing, yeah. Um, but what I was going to say with, with that in mind is like what you do and what you do with Gogo Bordello, I think, puts action behind those words. And I think you've always done that. And I think now more than ever, it's louder and more potent and more powerful. Um, Thank so you. Thank you. Yeah. So what I, I know you've met Joe once, right? Yes, I have. And like, Absolutely. And I wondered uh, if you can kind of dive into that experience, because I know you wrote that song about it and about being wisdom struck. Yeah. Um, well, <clears throat> it's actually, you know, what you're saying is absolutely kind of logical because, you know, Gogol Borello comes out from that tree of the clash and angelic upstarts and bands that just had like very uh, deeply connected into social causes because, you know, growing up like in, in Ukraine on the outskirts of town, and it doesn't need to be Ukraine, it can be anywhere, but the mentality of, uh, you know, working class intellectual people, it's a particular way of uh, viewing things, you know, it's not a, it's not a relaxed uh, intellectual browsing that, you know, you know, when you when you when you grew up without a silver spoon, there's no really time to uh, uh, get too baroque about it. It's just like you stick to practical intellectual intellectual matters. And Joe <clears throat> and the Clash kind of really represented that, uh, along with you know many other bands. And you know, circling back to meeting him, it actually was super uh, emblematic of of uh that um of that background because when i met him i uh, did not realize it was joe yeah i spoke with him for about 30 minutes until another person told me so how was it for you as a young musician to meet joe <laughs> strummer and I was like, wait a second, of course it was Joe. I knew there was something that, uh, you know, that I was kind of dancing around with, you know, that this was like, a, you know, I mean, Joe was like a portal into many things, you know. But but the thing is that, you know, he didn't carry himself as any kind of, uh, uh you, you know, like that whole like velvet rope VIP VIP ness of it is like was alien to him, and uh, you know it kind of um, <sighs> later on. You know, <laughs> that night I, I went on and uh, it because I met him at the concert. We went to the after party also, and then I met him again already as Joe Strummer, and you know. <laughs> And uh, and as I um, as we talked about music, you know, it was amazing because he never brought up Clash, and uh, he he never really uh, tried to like, you know, kind of circle back to days of like full on glory of the Clash or anything like that. He was just kind of really where where we were at. It was I think it was 1999 or 98. This was like my first years in New York. And, um, you know, and then I learned that as I met more and more people, you know, around the world, that they had a similar experience with Joe. They would meet him and he would talk to them for like an hour. And some of them realized it was Joe. Some of them were told that it was Joe Strummer later. Huh. And it, it just goes back to that, like, you know, when, when you're coming from the outskirts, like, it don't fucking matter what your uh, you know uh, official status is. It's like 
it's kind of like, are you shining on a street or not? You know? Yeah. It's all, it's people. Like, that's amazing that he can just, like, talk to people without, you know, with in a way where it doesn't seem like, because even, like, when you talk about being a musician or listening to music, you eventually stumble on, like, you do music to some degree, or I play a little bit, you know? So Mm -hmm. you have, like, a whole half-hour conversation where he's like, oh, I was in a, that's amazing. You know what I mean? That's so, that's so Yeah, totally. Actually, most of the time we talked about the Stooges box set that came out at that time, and, uh, and the particular takes of the songs, you know, of uh, from the fun house. And they bought Tenorization took a turn to like the most extreme music that was ever released. So of course it was like birthday party yeah. and uh, you know, James Chance and the contortions and just like things that were just were truly extreme, you know. And were you hip to those bands too at that time? I grew up on those bands. Nice. <laughs> well, yeah. So that's like, was it the Stooges box set with all the like the Funhouse session where it's got like, like twenty takes of each song? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that was what came out like ninety eight or ninety nine. Yeah. Or whatever it came out, that's when we met. Like literally, like a week later. <laughs> that's a long one to get through, man. Like, there's a lot of the same song, and like to see that how that album grew though is such an experience, and I think that. That's well, that's a it's a filter in itself. I mean, whoever was there who can talk for half hour about Stooges box set or, you know, in my <laughs> case, three hours, <laughs> you know, that's a great with bond. That's for sure. Wow. So that's so cool. Like, so when you like when you move to because you moved to Vermont first, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Vermont refugee resettlement program represent right here. All right. And when when you were making trips out to New York, were you already playing with a uh, Cossack at that time, or were you just uh, the Cossacks? Yeah, yeah. Well, it basically was my proto Gogol Bordello band, yeah, in Vermont yeah. with yes, with Dana Shepard was a great punk hardcore drummer. It was, uh, you know, it was kind of as as a duo, and uh, and we had a number of bass players, kind of turning about and over the years but um yeah i met dana in uh, my first days as soon as i basically arrived to vermont from ukraine and uh, you know he was kind of he was he was from a dynasty of punk rockers like his older brother junior uh rest in power now but you know those were the his older brother brothers because there's six of them wow they were all like, you know, guys who went and saw Black Flag in 1980 and 81. And, and um, when Black Flag, you know, burned through time and space of Vermont. <laughs> and uh, and they were very seasoned kind of family in all things punk and hardcore. And I actually just, I got a lot of education from them. And then and I really hit it off and... You know, um, we started coming, playing New York City and, you know, other towns, New Hampshire and Connecticut. And uh, I think we played, you know, Massachusetts and uh, Buffalo with, with uh, you know, we started we started getting out and playing what we play. Uh, we made some friends in New York City, you know, start coming in and staying with, with the bands there. Uh, there was a cool band called Molotov Cocktail uh, where the singer was from Romania and uh, Gabby and uh, he was um, he was uh, working as a sound man in CBGB's so so we got to play there you know and uh, we got to play in Coney Island High which is another great place in the 90s was in New York City for bands of young, younger bands older Bands was just a great kind of mecca of punk rock, you know. Yeah. So, in fact, I uh, I remember Dana and I and uh, Jason, our bass player at the time, arriving to Coney Island High and to play a gig. I think it was for maybe CMJ Festival, and 
you know, we were just unloading, just getting out of the van. I saw uh, Joey Ramone and Tim Armstrong just yeah. there, you know, <laughs> you know, like, so of course, like, uh, we, we were like, wow, no fucking way. This is our first gig in New York City. And out of two people that are here right now, <laughs> that's Joey Ramone and Tim Armstrong. I was like, yeah. I think this is a good way to go. We should move down here. <laughs> of course, by the time we set up and start playing, it turned out to be that they all came to see another band, the Queers, that was playing in a mm. bigger room and yeah. that play in uh, Cornell High. So we were like super bummed out to play to like three people. <laughs> but, you know, uh, that's, you know, you start like that. And, but it was just amazing time. You know, we would, for me, it was mind blowing because I would come to New York City to play in these places and uh, I would walk around East Village and be like, man, here we go. Here's a punk club next to it or like, you know, three doors away from it is a Ukrainian restaurant. Hmm. And then it's another punk club. And then it's a Ukrainian social club. And then it's another club. And it's a Ukrainian sports bar. And that, it was like, yo, I think I found my place, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's let's look no farther, you know? So, I mean, I was always kind of, New York was always kind of very important, like, vector for me, kind yeah. of, for one reason or another. But the energy of certain New York bands, they were just kind of, like, providing me with, like, the biggest kind of kick. And uh, that kind of coming to New York in those years and mid nineties just kind of solidified my idea that I just got to live there. And so, you know, <laughs> decades later, here I come. And that's when uh, you moved above an art gallery, right? Yeah. Totally. On, on Ridge street. Yeah. That was a, another amazing kind of spontaneous uh, flow of events. But at the same time, it kind of gives you an idea how, you know, magical New York still was at the time, you know. Right. You know, just people could hit it off on a street and um, create some amazing things, you know. I mean, you know, no referral letters, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, no velvet rope, like just direct contact and... Um, the art and music scene was just kind of like um, living its life. Yeah, it was amazing. And and if you really have eye for it, it's still there. It's just kind of it's, it's thinned out a little bit. And of course, you know, the commerce and, gentr and gentrification like takes its toll on the vibe. But once again, if you, I mean, I always felt like I kind of caught the last call of that magical New York, you know? Yeah. And now you kind of have to carry like a magnifying glass in your back pocket to find it in New York, but you will, mm -hmm. you will, if you got that magnifying glass. I, yeah, I, t I definitely, I believe that art will find the cracks to grow out of, you know, like, yeah, and, and that's really cool to like have like, cause I, I work at a gal art gallery here in Cleveland and it's really cool because it provides all these crazy like opportunities to do whatever, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, and especially if you're like living above it and you were DJing the art gallery at night, right? Yes, actually you're, you're hitting us on, on a nail because it wasn't even really an art gallery. It was, it's called art space, uh -huh. rich okay. street art space. So it was everything. Yeah. You just a place that where, you know, the owner really kind of was hip to um, kind of expression, you know, street art, um, music, electronic music, authentic, um, you know, authentic, you know, folkloric music, which was terribly unhip at the time. But I kind of took a spin on that and uh, popularized some of the more extreme, you know, versions of like ethnical music from Romania and, and Ukraine and some Balkan countries. So that became pretty kind of, um, 
you know, I mean, a lot of the punk rock people and just art people took to that. And this whole kind of like a Balkan music wave happened for the next five years. So it was like 99 until about 2005 or six. It was a pretty massive wave of it. There was a whole badge of DJs in the city just ripping and riffing on all those Balkan riffs. And um, in fact, there was so much of it that I kind of had to run away in Bra- to Brazil yeah. from it for a while. <laughs> Did, um, yeah, did that, switch it up a little bit. Uh, did that uh, like experience of DJing and like also kind of being in a band, but like when you're working a room like that, the whole goal is to get everyone moving and feeling this energy like nonstop. Did the oh, that yes. experience help the band experience? Yeah, it's stop spectating and start participating. You know, it's first things you see that you go to you know, punk and hardcore shows when you're a kid. So, and as we all know, whatever blew you away when you were 14, 15, you know, that's going to be your um, biggest kind of compass right? for for uh, for the rest of the life. <laughs> I mean, you'll add more things and hear more things, but, you know, if you had like great experiences, whatever they were with music or whatever it was at that age, it sticks with you because, you know, like going to punk shows and hardcore shows or, you know, I mean, hardcore basically, it's all punk rock. So it's just like you learn early on that this is a very different hang and you value that hang because it really provides you with kind of like uh, a community that's almost instant. It's like instant family, you know, just, right. just add me and there it is, <laughs> you know, and it worked. I've seen it worked both ways back in Ukraine when I was a very little kid, you know, 13, 14, going to the shows and that were which were put together from crumbs of equipment and you know from nothing like sometimes we'd have to build the stage for the show with you know arm and hammer and plywood because you know in order for the show to happen you know bureaucratically speaking you know the authorities would have to have a stage you can't have a show without stage you know it's just so stupid <laughs> you know but with okay fuck it let's, let's build a stage you know build a stage for a week so the show can happen you know then you know and and you build tighter bonds with kids that way that are much better bonds that you build in like some like uh, you know, official like sports section or something like that in, in a school you know what i mean it's yeah. just or if you go to like some big band show where it's just like yeah it's cathartic while everybody's there and then everybody just kind of you know how pop culture is it's just yeah people are yeah and then everybody goes their separate way this is different you know this is like you go to the show together you at the show together and after the show you go together to each other houses it's like this whole thing and you stay in touch and uh, and then I seen it work exactly the same way when I you know moved here and uh, you know started going to hardcore shows on 242 Main in, in uh, Vermont. In uh, it was basically Teen Center that was kind of took a focus on punk and hardcore shows. So mm-hmm. I've seen just about every band from East Coast in that place. And um, the same thing, like, you know, I was, I was, uh, I didn't even speak English at the time, but I was included then. It was all inclusive, you know, like, yeah, I was already going with that flock of kids who were running the scene at the time to, to the shows out of the States. And it was just, you know, it's funny because now everybody's talking about all inclusivity and diversity, right. like it's some new thing. It's like, 
in punk rock it was always like that yeah you know it's not uh in, in for people who were like looked beyond you know a schlock of like just you know pop culture all the diversity was always there you know so when you moved here and you didn't really speak english you like no no not really yeah yeah like, i mean very minimally mostly just my vocabulary consisted of the names of the bands like that's i knew what the clash means because i translated it yeah and with a with you know with a, a paper dictionary back then and I knew what dead is because of dead Kennedys, you know, and, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, but that's what I was so going to ask was like, did the music help you, did, did the punk help you understand English? And it sounds like the answer is yeah, because your dad was, well, like, yeah, he spoke yeah yes, but what's that? I said your dad spoke English, right? My dad spoke pretty good English. He okay. was a, a kind of sizzling student on that front. In fact, that was a. Uh, you know, he went to like Baltic Baltic Republics when he was high school student to represent Ukraine on a, you know all this linguistic Olympics and stuff like that. So, which was just another detail that uh, was against him actually, as far as like you know the Soviet uh, reputation goes. I mean, he was just outlawed basically at certain point because of all this pro-Western thought that he was demonstrating with his, uh, you know, lifestyle and style. And, and uh, so eventually all of that resulted in us leaving because just things got heavier and heavier over the years on my dad's shoulders and making him feel like we can't live safely in the Soviet Union. because so Ukraine was still part of Soviet Union back then. So, but yeah, for me, I, I was busy playing. I wasn't really, um, I was like, okay, I'll learn it when I get there. And I, I learned it fast. I think that, I think that my English probably hasn't really improved since like 91. I think like whatever I learned in the first year is kind of like what I'm utilizing still, maybe a little bit few adjectives here and there, but yeah. Wow. It's, 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 I don't know, to learn a language at any time, you know, at not being like a young kid, you know, like that you'd been a teenager at that time. Like, yeah. it's hard. Yeah, it's 16, hard. 17. I don't know. I think that that was the winning part because your hard drive is still relatively empty, you know? That's true. That's true. Like, I, I yeah, I tried, and you remember it uh, well. I mean, I, I, uh, when I was living in Brazil, I tried to get a good hold of Portuguese and, and I thought I did, you know, like to the point of like having conversations and well, daily life, that's easy, but more like on a more, uh, you know, more patterny level. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, it's just kind of, it doesn't sink so deep. I mean, to activate it, like I need to spend like two weeks in Brazil for it to like come back. Mm. That makes sense though. Practical, like application you're in it do you uh yeah do you ever find that like there's certain as far as like writing songs that there's certain like words that aren't in one language that you have to go to the other one to express yes yeah yeah totally that's a i mean that's a very kind of i think that's like a pretty acknowledged thing amongst like poets yeah. you know who or, you know, speak several languages. And uh, I mean, it, it actually goes deeper into ling linguistics and how does the words, what's the genesis of words, you know, and, and, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, it, you know, even though the roots of the words are common, you know, you can see traces of same word from like, Romanian to Portuguese and to English and German language because, because you know, because of all the Latin right. the root, root of those right. words, but they're still express such a different climate zone, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just a, such a different swag in those words that, you know, I think I think that 
the language kind of carries a lot of mood in it and uh, the in environment that it came from you know? definitely yeah yeah i mean it's i think some people just get really heavy exploring that and there's a lot to rap about that oh definitely definitely and like kind of sounds like i don't, I don't know like um with writing like that because there's some languages that don't have words in others like uh, totally i'm trying to remember if it was a uh so daddy so daddy the, yeah. that's like a famous portuguese example of that like the melancholy for something that never was right the nostalgia so, yeah. for something that never was but yeah that's such like a powerful yeah. writing tool right that's so cool um, yeah yeah i yeah. think so i think that that like gives you a palette like one thing i've always admired about about you is your songwriting and like it's surrounded Thank by you. this energy in like what you're saying is really philosophical and in deep thought and like to have that other Thanks. access to words like that um now like uh, your uncle uncle was like a he had like books that you guys couldn't like most people couldn't get right like as far as like phil uh, philosophical reads yeah he he was a no he is a painter and uh, he finished you know art academy and uh, he traveled to hungary and czechoslovakia and at the time even though those countries were of eastern bloc but their filter for western formation was a little bit or quite a bit um more open hmm. and uh you know there was he he would have books that you know not only on art history where they're like going to details of like you know Dadaism and surrealism, and you know, that's linked to Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and psychoanalysis. So, all of that is like all he had, he had it, and I mean, he had it in his, in his home. So, you know, since he babysat me a lot, you know, the family was one of the awesome things in Ukraine is in a peaceful time, you know, people. You know, it's like people help to raise kids all together, like it's a given thing, you know, like old grand, great grandparents and grandparents and uncles and aunts all chime in raising the same chi child because everybody's hustling and everybody's doing so busy. So anyway, he was raising me uh, a lot. And so I listened to a lot what he and my dad were listening to and browsed through all those books, you know, like architecture and just classical painting and and of course some of the most intriguing of those books were you know things with like psychoanalysis and uh you know excerpts from freud carl Jung, and andre breton and marcel duchamp and all those guys you know yeah which is so close to punk rock you know right i mean dada is basically punk rock of you know art you know? <laughs> It's the no wave. It's all right there. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's full on no wave, actually. You're, you're, you're right. Um, did, were you like, were you an avid reader? Were you taking all this in? Because like, that's some heavy stuff, you know? Yeah, I was. In fact, <laughs> I think I was taking so much of it that um, it's like, <laughs> I remember how like around 15, you know, from being like kind of kind of i would say you know kind of guy who was like in with most of the most of the life events and kind of you know i was still on the sports team and and uh you know i was kind of I'd say had a pretty good 360 kind of social circle. And then at that point, just I think I internalized and uh, was, you know, studying so much of all those things that I just became a total weirdo <laughs> <laughs> in my, like, um, my social circle just like narrowed down to like a few <laughs> punk rockers and like, I, and I didn't need anything else. It's like, and like suddenly like you know uh more kind of 
normal girls like that I had a good accord with just like disappeared from my life. <laughs> and only like art, uh, you know, my girlfriend, she was a painter at the time and like, you know, 16 is kind of like a, uh, was age of like total no wave. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, estrangement for me. <laughs> That's a, like uh, that's a, it's interesting like at, um coming from like like sports were you like pretty disciplined like if you set yourself to like a routine of reading or a routine of like writing or creating do you find yourself like easy to stick to that Yeah I mean you know that gave me pretty much a backbone for the rest of the years and, Yeah um yeah it's an interesting thing between um, you know, European like outlook on punk rock and and, and American. Uh, apparently, I was siding more with the American way because, you know, in Europe, everything, uh, you know, from that kind of like punk rock world was just kind of not really hanging with anything athletic. And so any, in a way I kind of had to, um, I mean, I quit sports because I just went fully ham into music right? and because it was like so uncool, you know, in, in a way back then in Kiev to be in punk rock band and like be on a, you know, serious, uh, athletic team. So I mean, music took over and I just kind of, you know, close the chapter of my life. But uh, we already, you know, we had so much, um, we had so much, uh, we already internalized so much discipline from all this year in, in sports that I kind of took all those skills into touring later when that came up, you know, and yeah. I don't know if I'd ever be able to do that without that kind of, <laughs> A mindset, you know, of a long distance runner, which is what I, you know, which was what I was good at, you know, and the cool thing that encouraged me to like get back to it here, at least on personal level is that, you know, I came here and I saw like all these like skate punk bands and, and just album covers with like, I saw token entry album cover, uh, a great hardcore band from Queens with a, you know, uh, skateboard and mascot. Uh, and I was like, oh, these things do go together actually very well. Okay, I'm yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you know, Henry Rollins, of course, has right. to do with it a lot. And like, just like, I looked at it in a whole different way and realized that these things go greatly together. And, um, and yeah, and, and they still do. What, you, like, when I was, like, at that age, I found – I never got any sports, but I got that mentality from Bruce Lee. Are you, are you hip to Bruce Lee at all? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. when I was younger, yes, but, you know, he kind of had a funny few things to yeah, his yeah, gig, some, you know? <laughs> not some great things. But it was yeah, like, once you, like, you know, hang out in the, in the real martial arts world, you'll learn that there's – you'll see through the cracks of that and uh, – I mean, he, he was a great, you know, icon for that generation, and he had some good things to say. And but essentially, he was, you know, he was. Uh, let's say he was a popularizer of great um, topic, you know, of martial yeah. arts. But it was a, really a, a lot of it was kind of, you know, very. Um, it was a movie actor actory yeah. and very uh, show businessy, you know. Yeah. Well, did you do you do you do martial arts or study martial arts? I gave it a swing several times, yeah. and uh, especially when I was living in Brazil, you know. Here's the thing, you know, if you play an instrument, uh, you know, one shoulder whiplash will yeah. be enough for you to kind of like back off from that because, um, because it's like, hey martial arts or playing guitar uh, i'm gonna have to go with playing guitar <laughs> and uh, so but i i took a lot from it and i kept actually studying for years with 
several different guys who were teachers of uh, Wing Chun and uh, Marshall Qigong, which is kind of a, it's basically martial arts, body conditioning. Did, um, did any, like, from those, like, that those practices fall into, like, songwriting? Because one thing that fascinates, uh, fascinates me about your, your songwriting is your ability to, like, almost Hemingway certain phrases. Like, maybe, maybe that's, <laughs> well, like, um, uh, the, the hardcore. Like, you only have so much time. Say what you need to say now and it's efficient. Like, uh, yeah. one, one, one phrase from a... Uh, uh, it, it wasn't. I don't think it was in song, but it was "fuck the time before the time fucks you." That was like <laughs> my mantra for a long time. <laughs> like, yes, but exactly. Well, okay. So, since you're bringing that up, that's definitely coming from that world because that's very. That's like. That's like. Zan for. That's like Zan Buddhism in a nutshell for yeah. punk rockers, <laughs> right there, because you know. You, you know, martial arts are very connected into uh, philosophy of life, and a lot of it is, most of it goes back to Zen, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, new age cheesy talk about Zen this and Zen that, and you know, fucking quantum this and quantum that, but, <laughs> but getting back to the essence of those things, yeah, you know, it is about training your mind into a focus on a current uh, moment. And uh, it's a lot deeper thing and it's a lot more intense than like, you know, all these like, you gotta be in a moment, you know, yeah. live now. It's, it's a kind of like stupid incarnations of those things. But um, in the gist of it, it's definitely the most effective way of life. And, and it takes a lot of training. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, you know, it's 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 training of the of the body and of the mind, and meditating is is exactly that training. So, you know, escaping, stopping the inner monologue, or how some describe it as inner dialogue, or you know, it's kind of the key point, you know, get, get into a focus, get into a hyper focus on, on now, because the mind, you know, is like a, you know, it's like a rabid animal is always running away. It's a galloping horse. I mean, I'm just like quoting straight out, out of those like Tao things, you know, right now it's a galloping horse and everybody's got one. So you always have to harvest it and bring it back into now. I think it's well said, though. Um, Eugene, I really appreciate your time. I got a couple more questions, and I like. I want All to right. Again. Thank you so much. This has been a blast. Um, one of which being, um, so you guys, you did a show in the Ukraine, and you had to mm -hmm. sneak in there. Um, w in Ohio, we had a a doctor. His name is Doctor Eric Johnson, mm -hmm. and uh, he he stopped working when he was working and volunteered his time and snuck into the Ukraine to help be a medic on the scene and help out. So that process isn't easy. And like to get a whole band in there, I couldn't imagine like that was an easy feat to make even happen. But I imagine it had to be like an insane, like life altering experience. Well, there's, there was no any kind of sneaking in. It was very well organized and huh. super efficient. I mean, I don't know. I read yeah, that's that's a little bit of uh, um, I mean, broken I telephone, maybe. Yeah. But uh, no, we were picked up by a military convoy at the border, and uh, I don't think it's a good idea to try to sneak in in there. You know, yeah, it's, it's not the time. I mean, it's never a good idea, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing is, uh, it was. Uh, Think something that we we really wanted to do, and um, and then we received an invitation to do that, you know, and it was super well put together uh, logistically, and um, the purpose was to go on, you know, yeah, you know, morale is super important. It's 
it's uh, when people see that other people are physically coming, you know, they they know you mean it. And, um, you know, playing on a military basis, you know, like helping uh, just, you know, uh, with 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 musicians from the army, it wasn't just like some kind of a um, you know light thing. It was um, we had a we had a program prepared. We learned their songs. They learned our songs, and we played for the battalion that was actually met the enemy at the first days of war. And um, it was great, you know, to spend some time with the defenders afterwards and um you know to see that people's spirit is very strong like they're um it's not a myth that uh their 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 inner core is indestructible once you're there you're like okay it's it is like that and and uh, in a way it's a huge relief and of course, you know, it's it's a huge honor to be able to play for the defenders and and in fact just see them enjoy and open up the music and some of them are already knowing the music and and it's a huge honor for to be asked, you know, yeah. if they keep if they can keep playing our songs, you know, continuously in their in their set. And to me that was like pretty much the highest um uh, you know uh, compliment for for the songs written you know right right so that that's pretty massive and you know and of course we we were able to also to go to some refugee hubs and uh, support you know um uh, refugees there it was amazing and yes and also for the band it was a whole another uh, bonding experience yeah, I can. Yeah. I can imagine because I've seen I've seen videos of you um, going all over the world and just playing with people that you meet, mm -hmm. um, and which is a very zen to kind of bounce off a very zen thing to be able to do. And you never know, you know, when you're playing with someone you just meet, how that's going to work. But there's a there's a connection right there. Um, so like that to be able to like be free and be in that moment and share that experience and express with people and like kind of learn from them like that that's really incredible and then to have like the the whole the build off the whole idea of morale like sun tzu has like a whole part in the, the art of war about mm -hmm. how important morale is yeah and like of course and, and uh socrates has got the whole bit about how important music is to that mindset you know so to be able to do that that's incredible especially in a time like now yeah and if we go before socrates <laughs> to heraclitus <laughs> You know, there is a lot to be said about, you know, providing sense of direction uh, for people, you know, and uh, via intuition, you know, because, you know, a lot of people are were just caught into that kind of like uh, in the beginning of war in the West, it took a lot of people to kind of like figure out who kind of like who's the bad guys who's the good guys is when it's just like some people have a very intuitive either well informed or intuitive response to it and um it was like super important to in the beginning of of this attempt of invasion and i'm gonna call it attempt of invasion because the invasion is never gonna happen uh, it's a feeble attempt of invasion and it just was amazing to see people, you know, that have amazing track record in the world of art, like Patti Smith or, you know, Ministry, old Jorgensen, yeah. you know, just like be like, all right, we stand with Ukraine, you know, and that gives a lot of these powerful individuals, you know, they, I think they clear the air for a lot of people, you know. And that they're trusted voices in, in, a, in a lot of ways, you know, for right. a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot of people that turn to, uh, just like how we turn to Joe Strummer for advice, you know what I mean? Totally. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I, I kept saying all the time, you know, where's Joe when you really need him? And, you know, you, you know, and, you know, wish Joe was alive, he would, 
you know, he would be, I'm more than certain that Joe would be one of the first people in, uh, in, in voicing the, the opinion on that and providing that sense of direction, you know. Definitely. And I think he would be blown away by what you guys have done. Um, on a on an oh. album related question, uh, mm -hmm. what would a uh, Eugene from the band Vinegar Face think about having <laughs> a song having a song with um, HR from Bad Brains on it? You digging deep, man? Like <laughs> that's Uxusnik, yes, Vinegar Face, Bitter Faces, <laughs> and the name of my first band in back in Ukraine. Um, that was a kind of no wave band. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of influences there, but, you know, I think that, I mean, Bad Brains were a very mind-blowing band. I think anybody who heard Bad Brains at first, you know, they um, were stricken by its um, kind of, ferocious amazing high frequency energy and and absolutely unexpected turns of events in the songs you know yeah unexpected chords some modulations that are just like and the riffages that were just all jumpy and like super <laughs> coming, coming coming from so you know of course bad brands was like a major major um turning point and taste development for me, like Fugazi, Bad Brands, you know, um, um, many other bands, but HR, you know, is like, is such a singular force and uh, a voice of a sage in, in, in punk rock and hardcore music. And, um, I was, you know, lucky to meet him through, um, uh, Friend, common friend of ours, Jesse Mallon, who's a kind of a very central guy in, in punk rock scene and not and beyond, just kind of punk and rock and roll scene in in New York City and beyond. And um, uh, through Jesse, I was able to have kind of more, like you know, we we're doing an interview together for Jesse's documentary and HR. HR was very cool and kind of a kind uh, spirit, you know, and we had a good conversation and we were mixing the record already at that point, actually. And, um, you know, the idea like to have him on it came up and we were blown away that, you know, he was into it and he liked the song. And uh, because the song already, the idea came up naturally because the song had a lyric about, you know, us living in the times of tectonic changes and, uh, you know, eras are falling like dominoes, you know, and eras are just going away. And it's like, you kind of need to build an Noah arc of your own and, you uh, sail away so that sail on line was kind of mingling in there you know lurking oh, yeah. and uh, the way hr fulfilled this musical you know vision that came together it's just we were like basically you know like in a sappy trance nearly in tears when that happened you know <laughs> yeah. it was a big blessing for an album you know so forever respect to great hr you know and bad brands just amazing just amazing makes the hair stand up on my head every time i hear it when his voice comes on our song yeah it's so cool like it, it's like how you said it's blended in there perfect and like it hits that whole narrative of the song so that's amazing to learn that it was like kind of after the mat you know like that's so cool but that's also punk rock for you you know it's right it's like it you know there is Forget the velvet rope and all that, um, all those hindrances, you know, even now, like, like right now we're, we're playing a cover 
uh, one of our essential parts of the show is a cover of amazing song that um, old OE punk band from London. Uh, actually, they're not from London. They're from, um, and I got to look it up. They're from, I think they're from Sheffield, maybe. Uh, Angelic Upstarts. Um, fantastic band, wrote epic songs, you know, very social, uh, social matters, uh, very working class, intellectual things that we talked about, that kind of, you know, they wrote a song in support of Polish workers breaking away from Soviet communist dictatorship in 1980s. And, you know, we now play this song as kind of double tribute to um, Angelic Upstarts, who wrote the song supporting people's struggle, and as a tribute to Polish people who been so supportive of Ukrainian people's struggle. Yeah. You know, and you know, you get the song together, you put it out there, and you know, unfortunately the singer Mancy, he passed away about a year ago. But you know, I wrote to through friends to another uh, to band members from Angelic Upstarts and you know the next day you get like an, a great uh you know, also very thoughtful, like super supportive message, you know, and, and there's an instant connection, you know, it's, it's just great. It's like, it's nothing like that in any other form of music where there's like it's polluted with agents and lawyers and all this, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, it, it has to be done in a certain way. Like we get it, like for records to come out and yeah. all these contracts needs to be signed, but in, in punk rock, you know, there's a lot of soulful communication uh, that is direct, and I, I just love that. You know, I mean, it's it's, it's very singular to this um, aesthetic. I definitely agree, and that kind of goes back to like experiencing it the first time in all these new places, and like totally. that's one um, one thing that really stuck out when I saw you guys in Cleveland. Um, you covered Bob Dylan, "One More Cup of Coffee." But while yeah, sti- yeah, you're well, sitting on two uh two cajones, and I was like, yeah. this is like, I've always heard this in my mind as go go cajones. Yeah, my mom doesn't like me doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what brought up? I mean, it seems like with this record, it was kind of like, uh, aside from like this pulse to move forward and help people, um, also like kind of a callback to like um, um, your roots in a way, like your Ukrainian roots and like your punk rock roots and you guys cover Fugazi on it. Yes. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people in the band, you know, and there's a lot of influences here and, you know, we trade been trading music as chief source of communication for, for years, you know, and, uh, actually it's, it's, it's about punk rock roots, about, you know, particular roots of whoever, of whichever band member it is, like Pedro from Latin America. He, you know, he's from Ecuador. He educated me a lot about, um, you know, what what was happening in in that world musically. You know, um, you know, we all kind of fulfill each other with um, and keep turning on into each other to different various kinds of music. Uh, and also, you know, Romani roots are very important, you know, the, that streak in my family was always connecting me to something that's just kind of so unifying, you know, just gypsy music is just so powerful and kind of sophisticated and primitive at the same time that, um, it's kind of had a lot to do with, you know, us coming together as a band because you know sergey and yuri you know they're virtuosos and like classically trained and the thread of gypsy music was that's how they connected into us who are essentially you know punk band right and together we whipped and shaped this kind of a singular more uh you know our own brand of punk rock you know 
so you know so in a way like see, doing that cover of bob dylan and oh man it's it's three i'm gonna have to go right after this okay. but uh it's sound check time um you know doing the bob dylan song was not only tribute to bob and you know his knack for art and songwriting but it's also a song about uh, bob essentially um hanging out with gypsy family i don't know why some people think that it's a song about like south of the border hmm. it's pretty clear that it's a song about him uh visiting probably most likely san marie de la mer gypsy pilgrimage romania pilgrimage uh, festival and um, it's about his encounter with Romani family where they're seems like they're not being particularly inclusive and trying to get him to split yeah. <laughs> well, even with the melody he and, like he hits that hits that flare yeah i think that what i counted it once i like sat down went through all his stuff i think he has at least four songs where it's gypsy lou come, mm. comes again um then there's this one and there's two more songs that are heavy on the topic i mean of course he was pretty enchanted with that idea you know so but my friend thank you for having me i do have to run and meet my brothers and sisters at sound check at this time very cool eugene thank you so much for chatting with me i've been looking forward to talking with you for a long time your music and your 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 words, just like in interview clips, have been a constant inspiration. So this was a great oh, thanks, honor. Man. So thank you, my friend. Thank you, man. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having me and for your time. Yo, Spike Spiegel here. You just listened to Zig at the Gig podcast. Keep riding the bebop. See you, Space Cowboy. Bang.